this is so exciting. I don't think we've ever had a rock star in the room before. So uh, we are really, we have lots of rock star entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, but this is exciting. So uh, is this your first time at Stanford? Yeah, you still don't have a rock star. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think we'll, uh, yeah. yes. Okay, so here we have Cameron, here we have Nate, and in fact, uh, uh, Nate this morning got a chance to go play golf at the Stanford Golf Course. Yeah. yeah. Pretty it was cool. Amazing. Yeah. The, well, yeah, I was, I was just like, bumming around in Florida and, and other places, and um, to come here is just incredible. Fabulous. As yeah. an excuse uh, that, that, you know, I'm only here because I was able to play the golf course earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, maybe we can entice you back again. Probably. So let's get started. Um, a lot of people in the room are not that familiar with the music industry. We're certainly pretty familiar with the Silicon Valley entrepreneurial ecosystem. Maybe you could give us a little bit of a tutorial about what it means to be a producer, a manager, a executive, and also an artist in the music industry. Cameron, you want to kick it uh, off? Well, I'll start quickly. So um, the music business, the music business is uh, really at, at, you know, divided into major companies and independent companies. And now the major companies are really Warner Music Group, which uh, I'm a part of, uh, Sony and Universal. And, and then there's a whole host of independent companies that are, that are smaller than the, than the majors. And generally, you know, on the, uh, um, the business is divided in two. Uh, recorded music, which is the, the kind of the classic record business where we find artists, we make recordings of the music, and we exploit that music however we can, you know, through, through CD sales, through downloads, through streaming, through uh, um, licensing of all different types and also the music publishing business, which isn't really the music publishing business. It's called the music publishing business because you know, 100 or 200 years ago, they used to publish sheet music, but really today it's more probably the music licensing business and the song business. And that business is about um, owning and managing the underlying songs, the, the intellectual property of the songs themselves, the compositions themselves. So every song's written by somebody and um, they own that song, and, and then it's, it's used in various ways. So, you know, that's, that's the music business that we're in, and then there's artists and managers and booking agents and lawyers. There's a whole industry of people that, that um, make a living working around the music business, and artists and songwriters. Great. What about I, from the artist perspective? I am the exploited. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a terrible word. So, so uh, the we lawyers, the, music, not the, the managers, everybody. Uh, I, I, I create music, make art, um, write songs. It's, they're not uh, mutually exclusive or together, art or, or music. Um, and I like to, to do a little bit of everything. And, and uh, that usually means that eventually have to go out on tour or uh, do interviews or do other stuff like that. But, um, but the music industry, where I'm at right now, is, is a great place because, because um, you know, I've had opportunities. I've been on the radio and have sold music. So, so to get to, I guess, um, dictate, have a little more of a hand in dictating what, what, what I do as an artist, is, is, it's a great place to be. So around here, we know about all different types of investors, you know, whether it's seed funds that really look at companies very early on, and those who invest later stage. At what stage do you start investing in, in artists? And, and is, maybe you could tell you a little bit about how you were discovered. And, and I mean, it, you were really young when you first got your first record contract. Yeah, I was, uh, I was 18 years old, um, uh, playing in a local, local band in Phoenix. and. Uh, and the radio station had started to play our music, and um, major labels had caught caught wind of it. And next thing you know, we're signing a, a big contract. And, and um, when you sign a contract that's too big, and, and you don't sell a lot of albums, you end up getting dropped. And then I was re-signed by the same company about four years later um, in a different band, which is it, it's it's a very weird, you know. I, I guess just never giving up, and and uh, I've always had some sort of cult fan base to, to rely on, which is an important thing. Um, it's an important thing. You know, I talked about how it's easier to make decisions now um, after you've, you've kind of made it a little bit. But, but it's, it's also wonderful to, to step out onto your own and, and, and uh, I guess, not be as reliant on, on, on the big companies. Though uh, I think it took a lot of, a lot of failing 
uh, to to appreciate what what a company like like Warner, um, whether it be the publishing or or the record companies, can do for you when when you're ready to. Um, <laughs> we're gonna keep saying exploited, which I think we need to just like we need to erase yeah, that yeah. word. Okay, I'm like, sorry. Absolutely. That's my fault. That's my fault. So maybe you could talk a little bit about it, Cameron, about you know. At what stage you're looking for artists? Are you trying to find the folks who are, you know, in a small club or a coffee shop playing a guitar, or are you looking for people who have a big fan base already online? I, well, there's no real, you know, there's no real one recipe. So we are generally just looking for very talented people who we think will connect with an audience, um, and you know, sometimes that's. We, um, Sometimes they have big fan bases. Sometimes they have small fan bases. I think w one of the things about the company, you know, when you're a company as big as Warner's, is we're dealing with all different types of artists. So you know, um, to put it in perspective, on, uh, on at the publishing company, you know, we we publish everybody from, you know, the Gershwins to Cole Porter to Radiohead to Lil Wayne to to Nate Roos to. Um, Jay Z and Beyonce and Katy Perry. So you know we've got a wide array of people doing a lot of different things. Some of them are current with huge fan bases. Some of them are are historic with with huge cat song catalogs. So you know there's a there's a there's a lot of um, a lot of nuance to dealing with the various people. But when it comes to finding talent and developing artists and and investing in people's careers. Um, we're looking for them at whatever phase they're at. You know, I think some sometimes we we're we're very early, and sometimes it takes uh, somebody a period of time to, you know, to be ready and to be on the in the place where where it makes sense. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship? How much shaping gets done of the artist? Uh, one of the things I've learned about in getting to know the company over the last few weeks is the term A um, and R. How many in the room have heard of the term A and R? Okay, a couple of people. Okay, uh, this was a fascinating concept. Maybe you could talk about that that process <laughs> and how that fits into sort of working a, with a, the artists. A and R, I mean, originally stood for artists and repertoire, and really that's the part of the company that creatively works with artists and/or songwriters on on the publishing side. But let's just stick to the record side. So that's the side that that finds artists, that brings them to the company, that. Uh, eventually, you know, hopefully we sign a contract with the artist and then works with them too to get the recordings done, to help help them connect to the company in such a way that we can connect them to an audience. So sometimes again, you know, there's no one size fits all. Sometimes the the artists are, are uh, you know, um, have a very clear artistic vision and, and write and and perform their own material. And some are um, are not songwriters at all but have an artistic you know, a take on on music and how they what they want to perform. So we may help them connect with songwriters or record producers or songs themselves that people send us. So there, there's there's a variety of things that that A and R does depending on 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 what the artist needs. One of the things that I've learned along the way is that it's actually pretty rare to be in a position like you, Nate, where you actually are a songwriter and a performer, that a huge number of people fit into one of those categories, you know, either a, a songwriter or a performer, and that's where this comes a matching. As a songwriter and a performer, um, what sort of relationship do you have? How much shaping do you get in, in, of your work, or are you given a lot of um, artistic and creative freedom? Well, a lot of artistic uh, and creative freedom, and, and that's, I don't think I was going to sign an, another contract with a major label unless it was something that I was going to get. Because, uh, as Cameron mentioned, it, it's it's good to have an A and R for for someone who might need a little bit of shaping. You know, um, when I look at a lot of artists, and if I'm critical, I think like, oh well, they could use a little bit of A and Ring in this department or that department. Um, I think for us, uh, you know, we're we're a confident bunch. Uh, I I had made I would seen the, the the problems that I'd had in the past. Uh, you know, artist development is is a very crucial thing, and it's not something that necessarily happens a lot these days. And I think that that's why we're seeing a lot of bands just come and go, or artists just come and go. They don't get an opportunity to develop. And uh, and I think that we, through the trials and tribulations to where I am now, um, you know, when when, when uh, we'd written and, and recorded that last album, we didn't have an A and R uh, because it was we knew what we wanted to do. We were very like. You know, you, to have a specific goal, but that, that's usually not the case. So usually, 
um, artists take full advantage of these type of resources? I mean, if, if it, yeah, they can they can be helpful. I, I had A and R on my first album on a major label ten years ago, and it was a, the, just a disaster. <laughs> you know, like the, the uh, people talking to you about about the songs that you're writing as a, as a I think as a as a band member or as an alternative musician or something like that. You look at it a little bit different. You know, I've written songs for other artists, and um, it's been set up by A and R people. Um, you know, those songs probably wouldn't happen if it were, wasn't for for A and R. Whereas uh, I'm not looking for any outside help in songwriting, so so I don't I don't need that. But when you hear like from an A and R guy, and he's, what do you say when I'm making my oh, I was making my first album? I was about 19 or 20, and he's, you know, it just needs to be a little more high octane, you know, and it's just. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to cuss. <laughs> Otherwise, we have Just to label it explicit. Bad, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's true in everything, right? There. So, good so, A&R doesn't use words like exploited. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we were talking. We were talking actually earlier today, and we were talking about the good ideas and the bad ideas. So maybe there's good A&Ring out of bad A&Ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so one of the things that we're very aware of here is technology trends and things are changing all the time. That's certainly true in the music industry as well. How do you both follow and create trends? Uh, well, I, I don't do either one. So, um, <laughs> but generally... Uh, I'm buying those shoes tomorrow. Yeah, actually, but, so. I, <laughs> but as a company, you know, I, I think it's a little bit counterintuitive, you know, because... Um, it's, uh, and I think it, it really relates to creativity and it relates to, to being an entrepreneur or you know, anything that's truly creative. It's the, the challenge is you know, how to remain fresh and creative and new in your approach so that uh, you, you know, you're, you're not following, you're not chasing something that's already being done, you're actually doing something new. And I think for, for, you know, for a company or for an artist or for, uh, you know that's that's just a huge challenge, and it's uh, it's it's an it's an exciting challenge, and it's one of those things when you experience it, it's it's really fantastic, and I think it's what keeps us all trying and keeps us all going back because, you know, I'm I'm amazed every year or you know put whatever time frame you want on it. I tend to use years, I guess, because that's the way we delineate our life in some fashion. But you know, every year the songs are are great. Every year there's more hit songs. Every year there's a song I hear or a bunch of songs that I hear that move me emotionally and make me, you know, want to listen to music or play it for my friends or play it for my family. And those songs usually don't sound like the songs that I heard last year. So it's, um, it's uh, you know, that's, that's the challenge. That's the, that's the infinite challenge that we have in the music world. Do you think about this? Do you think about trends? Or are you, as an artist, um, trying to buck the trends and trying to do something that's very different? No, I, I think that it's, it's um, as an artist, you know, I, I think that I didn't necessarily have the, maybe the mainstream success that I had until recently because I was so caught up in trying to kind of just make albums like uh, from the 60s or 70s, like Beatles-esque type of albums. And, uh, and I started to just lose focus on what was happening now. And I think with the last album, I had, I had realized that I was just going to get left behind if, if I wasn't going to start paying attention. And you know, there's a lot of terrible music out there. Most of it is terrible. Um, but, there's, but there's a lot of good stuff. And there's, there's people trying to do, to do new things. And, and, um, and I, I, I let it influence me. I, I, I've become better, a better songwriter, a, a, just a better person by acknowledging what, what's happening right now. You know, I think it used to just kind of scare me a little bit, but but now I, I think that it's it's been one of the biggest reasons for my success is to acknowledge that there's something in front of me and it's happening. Speaking of albums, people consume songs these days, you know, as well as albums. Do you think about this? Do you think in terms of developing a whole album, a whole collection, or do you think about you know one hit at a time? I think about I think strictly about uh, an album. That's how I was raised with my dad's record collections. Um, you, you, they they got to tell a story. You know that's right now I'm in the process of making an album, and and the biggest challenge for me is is the cohesiveness that's with the album. It's not about writing a song. I mean, that's you know that's a little bit easier. So, uh, it's it's or it's, it's it's a lot easier than than 
thinking about tying this whole entire thing together and how it's going to affect someone's life as opposed to just that that one little song. Whereas, like you know, in publishing, it's it's a lot different. You, you are a lot of it is based just around one song. A lot of the success is based around one song, and and that I mean it makes total sense. Um, I I was talking earlier about about other songs that I'd written and and how I might not you know, think that it's, it's, I'm not breaking any new ground. And, and uh, a lot of times as a songwriter, I'll take my name off of the song and put a different name under the song. And um, that's just a little fun for me because I like to see how far up the song will get uh, and not have like, a, and not be kind of associated with it. But, uh, but at the end of the day, I, I think that it's important people work too hard. And, and it's weird to be judgy. Um, you know, if like I, I, I try not to, to formulate like to say, you know, call a song out specifically because someone might love it and someone works really hard and they might get into their car after a long day and that what I consider to be a mindless song might come on and it, it's it's inspirational. It's great for them. Do you think differently about this? The songs versus the uh, songs? well, you know, I think Nate hit made a good point in publishing. It's definitely about the songs. We manage the songs individually, but. Um, in, yeah, we think about it 24-7, songs, albums, and singles. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing discussion and, uh, you know, which song, which is the single, which, which formats at radio, all of those kinds of things. Um, so, we, you know, it's one of the, uh, one of the, the real, um, one of the real influences of technology. On well, music is is the way people experience and consume the music, and that affects how they listen to it, how they engage with it, and how we connect artists to fans. And that's sometimes it's about whether they listen to whole albums or not, or buy whole albums. So speaking of technology, yeah, I mean we've got these cultural changes that are going on, but we also have huge technical changes, technological changes that are happening around us, and certainly are affecting the music industry. Is, I'm assuming you would think about this all the time. Is this, is this an exciting time to be in the music industry with all these technical changes? Yes, I mean, it is, it's an exciting time. There's no, no question. And I think it's probably more exciting today than it was you know, uh, a, a number of years ago. Because our, 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 um, the music industry as a whole has shrunk, frankly, over the last decade. So it's much smaller than it was 10 years ago. Um, for a whole host of reasons. One of them, I think, is, is the way technology has affected people consuming music. But on the other hand, it's growing in a different way. So it, it's really just, it's changed. You know, the, 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 rec the record business per se has gotten smaller, but the music business as a whole has gotten bigger. So the challenge, you know, to some degree for companies like ours is how do we go from being a record company to being a music company? And what does that mean? And, and how, how do we look at that? So. It's a it's a time of great change, which is really exciting, um, but also you know it's, it's challenging. I remember ten years ago, um, being like having just started, and I think I, I had gotten one of the last big contracts that that uh, that they were giving out to bands at the time, and it was it was just insane to see that that year. I think it was two thousand two, to two thousand three, and and iTunes took over, and everything everything changed, and and. Uh, we started to realize that we weren't going to necessarily have a job as a band unless we, we got out on the road and we, we made our money by touring and stuff like that. So we had to, we had to find ways. And meanwhile, I'm looking at the, the music industry and, and the, the people at our label at the time, and they couldn't figure out how to adjust. Um, we were thankful to be dropped by them because we were, just, we were watching them flailing. Uh, you look at people like Cameron now, and, and, and we've got another friend who uh, they're embracing it, and, and you're you're seeing the turnaround now because of because of people like Cameron. For, you know, for me, it's it just personally in my life. Um, you know, you know, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, really. I mean, I've I've worked at Warner Music Group for three years, but prior to that, I'd only worked for myself. So, um, <clears throat> in the music business. So when I started my company, it was a record company, and in 1999, 2000 is when we started to see the decline of CD sales and, and the, the explosion of technology with, with um, iTunes. In fact, I, was, um, I, would, I came up to Cupertino to see, and I was at the theater at Apple when Steve Jobs introduced iTunes to the music industry. So I, I was sitting in a theater about this big. But um, you know what it did for me is it made me start 
music publishing. So it was a big driver for me to change our business model and to find some new things to do. So I started a music publishing company probably within about 12 months to determine how, how can we, how can we um, you know, diversify as an entrepreneur, as somebody who was running a business with 22 employees. Um, you know, how, what are we going to do with this coming and with the change, the disruption that's going to occur? I think it's very interesting, the reframing of saying we're not in the record business, we're in the music business, and what new opportunities that opens up. Uh, in fact, almost everyone can be in the music business, right? Every kid in their bedroom or their garage can put together a band or sit in front of their computer and make music. What do you think about that? Is that a great thing? Is that a, is that a scary thing for a business that, that uh, used to sort of control the whole process? I think it's a great thing. I mean, to me, the more people that are engaged with music, the more people that, you know, one of the biggest, uh, I think, you know, one of the biggest issues I have in my life, and I'm sure for a lot of the people here, is, is you know, how do, how do you find the time to, uh, to listen and to engage with music, and, and how, how are we going to engage people uh, on an ongoing basis? And, and um, so the more people are involved, the more they, uh, whether they start out playing an instrument, um, you know, I always say for whether it's the artists, the fans, or the people that work at our company, you know, 90% of us fell in love with music at some point in our life. You know, usually when we were young with our family or maybe in our high school years or, or when we were in college or whatever, but that's what really drives us at, at, at the end of the day. So the more people that have that passion and the more people that connect to music on an ongoing basis, it's, you know, the better for as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, I think creating is is an amazing thing. I don't I don't play an instrument. Um, I just hear songs in my head, and and so I mean, I, I assume that it's something that pretty much anybody can do and and should do because it's fun. <laughs> Great, it's fun. Uh, <laughs> I didn't cuss. I just mouthed the cuss word. Yeah. <laughs> And, and for me, you know, I just that you know, I don't play an instrument. I don't hear songs in my head, but I hear them after they're recorded, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I know what to do after that. So, what are the biggest challenges? I mean, our room is filled with all these remarkable people, and there are a lot of people around the world who are going to be listening to this who are problem solvers, and they are music lovers. What are the biggest problems that are facing the music industry these days, and, and how would you hope that people would think about trying to tackle them? Uh, I'll take that one, I guess. <laughs> biggest problems facing I, the I, music. I, I, thank you. I didn't want to answer that question. <laughs> I was looking at you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, well, look, we've got lots of problems, uh, you know, and I, I think it's something we talked about before. I mean, I, I try not to get bogged down in the problems. Uh, you know, I think that we've got to look at them as opportunities because I think when we look at them as problems, suddenly it's like, you know, we've got all these problems. But we have lots of opportunities. I mean, we have technology, all the things that it brings. How do we monetize the music? How do we monetize our relationship with fans? How do we get more music to fans? How do we create a global company? How do we... How do we, um, you know, how do we find talented songwriters? How do we find talented artists? How do we, how do we connect those artists and their music with the fans in an efficient way? You know, how, how, um, how do we deal with, uh, how do we deal with the the um, the different interests, the competing interests that that are surrounding music? You know, um, the. There's now, you know, there's, there's the DMCA, there's Washington, there's legal issues, there's uh, royalty issues, there's all kinds of things going on. It's by far the most dynamic time in the, that the music industry has ever seen. So there's lots of, lots of change, and with all that change comes problems and opportunities. And I think that that's, you know, that's what we're doing here. We're hoping that... Um, that, you know, so that there's people here who will find ways to help us deal with all the things we have to deal with because, you know, we're uh, at Warner Chapel, we're a 200-year-old company. I was saying to somebody earlier today, we were Beethoven's publisher. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's with a million, 1.2 million copyrights under management, everything from all the artists that I just described. That's a big job unto itself. And then we have to figure out what do we do in a changing world? How do we deal with that? And there's only so much time in the day. So um, you know, how, how do we engage with really innovative thinkers, with young people who are in college campuses, who are, who are 
um, have their own experiences and their own ideas. So one of the things that makes this a very robust environment is the fact that there's a lot of experimentation. And what comes along with that is sometimes things don't work out as expected. Sometimes people call that failure. And uh, this is a sort of place where we understand that that's part of, the, part of the process, is that if you're not failing sometimes, you're not taking enough risks. Is this something that the music industry embraces, uh, the, the idea of experimentation and risk taking, knowing that not everything is going to work? As an artist, yeah, um, I, 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 only, I, I love the risk taking aspect of it. I, I don't like, I don't, even coming up uh, trying to write an album, you know, following up the success of this last one, um, one, of the, one of the things that excites me is just how much, how, much, how, how much further I can go um, and where I can go and, and to limit yourself because, because something worked is, is terrible. It's like it's atrocious, and and I hope I hope, I hope that it fails and that I love it more than I hope that it it it, it is great and I you know and it sells a whole bunch and I don't like it. Interesting, Cameron. I think you know it, for me it's hard to talk about the industry as a whole, all the time because, uh, frankly, I've never worked at any of the other companies. So. Um, uh, but for us as a company, you know, risk taking is certainly something that we encourage. I'm fortunate we have, you know, a relatively new ownership at Warner Music Group who are terrific. The, the guys who, the people who I am, um, who are my bosses and who I report to are extremely supportive of us taking risks, of us taking chances. Um, so, you know, I think one of the one of the things that we define our company by is culturally is having a culture, an entrepreneurial culture. You know, so to us, what what does that mean, and how do we do it? It means taking risks. It means being fast. It means um, being experimental. It means um, you know trusting one another. Um, decentralized approach to business, a flat organization. All of those things we try to bring to bring to the company every day because. Um, it's vital that we take risks, and it's certainly, you know, in our DNA too. I mean, uh, every every new artist deal, every every time we spend, uh, you know, from a business perspective, every time we invest in a new artist or we invest in new music or we in marketing or promotion or all of those things, you know, there's never any guarantees. The music business is. You know, I always say, yeah, that, you know, Google dueling banjos and give it a listen. It was a number one record, you know, and uh, it's, it's, there's all kinds of things that happen. So we have to be flexible and we have to be willing to take risk and we have to, um, it's a very, very challenging thing uh, for a lot of people in business school or, you know, for me when I was um, learning, the, the amount of risk that it takes to be an entrepreneur or that it takes to be in the music business is so much more significant than most other businesses that it, it takes a certain level of uh, passion and faith to, to really undertake it. And I mean, it's, uh, it's not, it's very different than finance. It's very different than banking. You know, it's, it's you're out on a ledge. I, I, I will, I'll just say this, I, I, I often, with people who come to work at our company, I often say, you know, there's, there's a continuum of risk here, and the artists are out here, because, you know, you've heard of the fear of public speaking, as people know. Well, just think of public speaking, but like having to write and read your own poetry and sing it, in, in, you know, I mean, it's, all, it's essentially a very, very risky undertaking. And, and then there's, you know, a, at the other end of this, there's all the more traditional industries and, and more traditional jobs. And, and then those of us that work in the music business or are entrepreneurs are somewhere in between. And that's where you really have to um, you know, follow, that, follow that passion and follow the faith that it's going to work out and you know, have some luck. You know, some of it involves a little bit of luck once in a while. I, 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 it's an important, important thing. I can't tell you how many times I'd sit in the conference room at my old company and everybody would be looking at each other going, what are we going to do next year, you know? And then something will come along. A record will show up. Um, An artist will show up. A, a hit will 
I'm come about. Dueling banjo. Was that the Deliverance song? <laughs> <laughs> that was a hit. I think. So. Did you do you publish that one? No, we don't publish it. But it's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> we should give permission for it to just be running right now, <laughs> free of charge. Just yeah, dueling banjo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's. Yeah. Yeah. I'm that's a, thought, that's right? a sadistic hit. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason why that song should work. Context, anything, but it did somehow. So. It tapped into something at the yeah. time. So let's dive into the creative process. So, Nate, you're in a band. That is a pretty intense creative uh, group. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about the process of working together as a band to not only um, create a song, produce a song? Um, what does everyone bring to the table and how the decisions get made in that, in that process? Well, I think it, it takes a lot of knowing what kind of what people do, do best. Um, uh, you know, the songs generally start in my head and uh, you know, I'll conceptualize conceptualize them, conceptualize kind of the album, where it's going to go, and then and then we'll all get together and kind of dissect it a little bit and make an album from that. And uh, and I think it works so well and fun because because we know each other, but we're all, we're also such close friends that uh, you know I've, I've been in writing sessions with people that I can't stand, and and uh, it doesn't doesn't help. Um, and I think to. To be, be around people that, that you trust, that you know kind of what their strengths are, and, and you kind of, there was a time early on in, in the band when, when we would just, the two of us would leave the room when, when the one person was kind of doing the thing that they specialize in. And it was just at the beginning of the, of the band because it was so exciting for, for us to come back into the room and hear what they had done. Because uh, while the songs, you know, you generally start, start with, with me, um, it's cool to see kind of the, the arc they take thereafter. Very cool. So I'm going to ask just a couple more questions and open it up to the audience so you can percolate on the type of questions that you would like to ask to our guests. So one thing that strikes me these days, it's very different than when I listen to music, is that all most songs come out with a video. And it's really interesting. So how does that affect you? Do you have to think about the visuals that go along with the song while you're writing it? Is that something that's part of it? And does that change your experience of crafting the song as well as the folks who are going to be listening to it? Um, me personally, no. I, I don't. The video thing is more of like a, a, a massive annoyance. <laughs> um, they have to like get in front of a camera and, and do stuff like that. I, I. I like the song. I like I, my favorite part about music isn't what I saw; uh, it's what I heard, and it's what what I heard and how it me, what it means to me when you're seeing a video. Uh, and this is just purely artistic. I'm sure that you know there there are reasons why we make videos, and it's it, it, they're all for business. Um, if it were up to me, we wouldn't make any videos because I, they just don't seem they seem kind of pointless. Um, I want people to hear the music, not see the music, and then get planted in their heads, kind of. What what they what they think this like I, I want people to 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 come up with what the song's about themselves. That's why I got into music in the first place. Good. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I, for me, I think I mean as a music fan, which is really what I am to begin with. Um, I was never I I I'm a big fan of listening to music. You know, I, I think that, uh, but I do understand, you know, YouTube is obviously a, a massive part of the way people consume music. Yeah, sorry, today. I don't want to sound like a dinosaur either. Yeah. <laughs> um, videos are cool. <laughs> um, YouTube is a, you know, is a, is a massive part of the way people consume music today. And I, and, and I actually, I think it's one of the, um, uh, I think it's one of maybe a, uh, future of the business or, or of music in general is how people experience music. And I, and I think there'll be visual aspects to it. I think that's one of the great things about you know rooms like this and, and places like Stanford is there's all kinds of tech, technology and, and innovation that's going on that's going to make music more experiential, in, in my opinion. And I think uh, video will be part of that in some fashion. Um, and then you have you know YouTube and 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 the phones with screens and and certainly there's a there's a whole lot of music that gets consumed with um, 
that gets interacted with through video. But at the real core of it, you know, at the, at the very, very core of it, the great songs and the biggest songs and, and, and the biggest artists have an ability to move people and make them feel and think and, or both at the same time through a song without a visual. Yeah, and I mean, um, I think that through, through the publishing world of things as well, I, you know, we got a lot of breaks on our, on our first uh, hit song just by, by it being um, on the TV show Glee and then being in a Chevy commercial. So, so it, you know, it's a nice, it's a, it, it works as an outlet to get your music out. Um, it, it definitely works on, on a business level. Yeah, I think that's, that's actually an interesting point. You know, there's also a lot of uh, use of music with visuals that come later or for another purpose, or, you know, whether it's a movie or a TV show or a commercial or uh, any of those things where we don't actually make the video that goes with the song, but for some reason, uh, you know, it can be a very powerful combination. Great. So let's imagine there's someone in the room or someone who's listening who so wants to be a professional musician. You know, they're, they, this is something that really is their passion. And they want to have this broad audience. How, what's the best way for people to think about the process of getting, quote unquote, discovered? <laughs> you take that I feel like that question, is, that question is like asked all the time. Uh, there's, okay. <laughs> the, the cool thing, I think, about the, this, this answer is that there is no rhyme or reason to it. You just. Uh, I think you, you, if it's a good song, I, I hope that, that um, through, through publishing or through record labels, you know, it'll, it'll find people. Uh, the internet has been so helpful in, in that, ma making, making people discoverable. Um, I will also say that if, if your goal is, is to get rich and famous, then you might, you might have picked like, the, wrong, <laughs> the wrong profession. So Cameron, yeah. though, do you go and troll on YouTube and see who gets a lot of views? Troll. I mean, you know, I mean, are you like I troll sitting on YouTube there looking for artists to for exploit? Like it's there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is that what you're doing, or or does someone have to get introduced to you? I mean, in he's in, usually just <laughs> writing a really a bunch of snide comments about Beyonce's uh, attire. <laughs> know that in the world of venture capital, in the publishing world, there are all sorts of unsolicited business plans and manuscripts, yeah. and things don't get read unless they are introduced. I mean, do you have a network of people that you count on to introduce you who are out there looking for talent? Or are you out there, you know, literally are people looking on YouTube to see who's getting views? Uh, I think there are, there, there's different approaches and there's different ways people do it. So there's, again, there's no one way anything happens. But I, um, we have people doing research, and most companies do have people doing research. And obviously, you know, th this is a, a, so we have people doing research, and, and that involves lots of different things. There's a lot of tools that we have. Um, you, they, they use, you know, in technology, we can see, um, believe it or not, you know, we have um, uh, companies and, and internet capabilities that allow us to see every radio station, how many songs, they, how many songs they play, what time of day they play our songs. We can see when things sell by market. We get lots of data in a lot of different ways. And so we have a research department that works through that data and, and will look for things that are working or not working. An area that could probably use a lot of help and a lot of work, frankly, is how we, how we find new talent, how we find talented people that are connecting with an audience. Because um, you know that's one way to do it. Um, but also, I think for me personally, um, you know, a more informal network of people that I know and I've got to know for many years. Some of them are, are, you know, everything from people who work in studios to people who work as in as lawyers or managers or booking agents or whatever, and also then just stuff that gets sent in. And of course, there's the friends of your parents and the friends of your brothers and the friends of your, you know, I mean, everybody knows somebody. So, um, but. You know, the reality, too, in my life with all of the people that, I, that I've been fortunate enough to work with, you, you know, there's basically two real truths to it. One is that, um, you know, I've been fortunate that all of the success that I've had in the companies that I've worked for have had is really um, uh, at the core based on creative people writing great songs and making great music. And secondly, everything that I found and ended up working with I was brought to me by somebody else. So I've never actually 
trolled anywhere and found anything <laughs> specifically. Um, but that doesn't mean it's it's not just you know one or one person in the room or two people playing me something or somebody I know sending me something. And ultimately, you you know you still have to make the decision: are you in or are you out? And that's that's the real challenge. That great. I bet there are some questions in the room. Who wants to start? Yes. And say it really loud. Okay. Um, so you said that you're trying to make the transition from being a record company to being a music company. Um, so obviously a lot of the money that was in recorded music has sort of transitioned elsewhere. Is this primarily in live performances and touring now? Or what, what are the markets that you're trying to go after in the music realm? Uh, well, yes, a lot of m there's there's probably more money in the live recording business. I mean, in the in the live touring business than there's been. I, mean, I don't ha have it in front of me, but um, yeah. But I would say it's more nuanced than that. I, I think we're looking at things like um, like uh, you know streaming services like YouTube, like new video services. How do we organize around that? How do we monetize our music in those situations, our videos in those situations? What's the best way to run a business around that? Do we sell our own advertising? Do we use somebody else to do it? Do we have an algorithm that does it? How do we create more videos to go with that? What's the business around lyric videos? You know, and I'm sure you guys experience a lot of lyric videos. There's a lot of <coughs> lyric websites. Yeah, what's up with lyric videos? Lyric video. What is a lyric video? A lyric video is a video that, that basically plays the lyrics of the song while the song plays. On YouTube, like on, on very, YouTube. Very popular. Um, so I can sing along? You can sing along or you can, or you can just read along. Yeah, it's like a karaoke type okay, of situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so you know, I think in, in all of those places we're, we're, we're trying to figure that out. Um, and how do you organize a business around it? What's what's the best way forward? Do we want to be in the in the live business as well? I mean, we as a company, um, uh, in certain instances, share in the live performance of the artists. In some instances, we don't. Um, you know, how do we? How I think what you know? How do we partner more with our artists and connect them to more to more um, more fans? Are there what are the global opportunities around an artist and around music? What's the music, you know, what are the opportunities? Are, how are people going to consume music in Eastern Europe? How are they going to listen? Are there opportunities that are different there than they are here? Are, you know, how, what's the relationship like with the fans? Those kinds of things. Great. Yes. When I was growing up, there used to be like four major record labels, and now there's only three, three mm -hmm. main players. Yeah. What do you attribute um, to Warner's ability to name one of these three main players? Can you please repeat the question? Just, you can repeat it. Oh, um, now, now there's three major record labels. How, what's, what capabilities and what ability do we have to remain? Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, well, look, there's probably a number of things. One is, the incredible history of the company and the and the scale of the music that we already uh, are in business with and the artists that we have, but I would say, um, you know, going forward, our ability to find new talented artists and connect them to fans, our ability to help them succeed in in doing that, um, that's really the lifeblood and the future growth of of our company. And and I, I would also say, you know, innovation and the culture of the company as a whole. How do how do we how do we continue to evolve? You know, on, on the Warner Chapel side, a 200-year-old company that's still thriving. How do you, you know, how do you create a culture? How do you continue to have a culture that attracts young people, that attracts smart people, that's innovative in its thinking, that's flexible in the way it approaches business, so that it can survive? You know, whatever whatever the world throws at us. And I think that's, you know, as a as a leader of a company. Um, of the size and scale of, of Warner Brothers and Warner Chapel, that's the real challenge is, is how, do we create, how do we create a sustainable ongoing business and business culture that's attracting people to help us, to drive us into the future. Great. Yes. Hi, I'm wondering, when you're looking at new artists, um, how important is talent versus like an image or a brand? Really the so the question was, how important is image versus talent? Yeah, so yeah, like, like it, it's interesting because um, 
you know, I guess uh, sometimes I'll answer it in two ways. First of all, talent is very, very important, and it's been proven to me over and over again. And I think there are times, you know, there are times in running, especially a smaller company, not so much running Warner's, but when I had my own businesses um, that are smaller, you know, you ebb and flow with your own success. And I think uh, I was it was constantly proven to me that that talent finds its way, um, and that that's uh, that's. I, 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 something I fundamentally believe in. I think then images, you know, image and how does that, you know, I guess I wouldn't always separate the two. I think oftentimes the talent and the image are connected very closely. So a lot of great artists that I meet and, and a lot of people that I meet, they have a kind of almost an innate ability and an, 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 a feel to have an image that's genuine and is themselves and, um, but also connects with people. So I think it's a vitally important part of what they do, but I don't think it's necessarily people have talent or they have an image. How do you feel about <laughs> mustaches? Mustaches. <laughs> if they got a little bit extra, it's great. <laughs> but so, you know, I think they, they come together. Great. Over here. Yes. Hi. How do you think Warner Brothers and artists should be compensated for the streaming services like Pandora? So the question had to do with compensating artists for streaming music, such as on Pandora. Yeah, like how would you ideally like to get as much as possible? <laughs> I think that was the right answer. <laughs> that that I mean that's our our job is at times, but no, I I think that the the reality is Pandora is a, a very interesting case and and. Um, uh, probably one that could you could you could put a whole a whole class around um, in terms of how it works it, with, with our industry, how it interacts, and, and what the right way to get paid is. But I think really how I would answer is you know uh, on a broader scale is we want to be we want to be paid fairly. I think Warner's wants to be paid fairly. We want our artists to be paid fairly. We can argue about where that point is, you know. Um, but I I also would say that we. Um, you know, we want to encourage innovation. We want to encourage new businesses to to use the content. We want to encourage uh, new investment and new listeners and and creative ways for people to experience music and for for fans to connect with artists and their music. So, you know, the and there's a lot of different views on how that can best be done, but. Um, Certainly, we've taken the approach, and I believe that um, you know we're pretty flexible in how we do that. We we encourage people to to get into business uh, and use the music. Great. Back in the way back. So I have a question about uh, pirating, and I'm curious what both of you think because you're veterans in this business, and so I know a lot of musicians, and I usually what I'll ask them is how they feel about being pirated, and it's usually musicians who are just getting started or maybe been in the business, not even the business really, but just been doing it for you know, a short while. Because um, it seems to me like the way that you get discovered nowadays is you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, people discover new music through, through piracy. And uh, it's almost a way uh, to measure how relevant a new artist is by how many people are, are looking for that person's music. And so, and the other thing is, uh, you know, if you have if you have these uh, pri or piracy sites such as Pirate Bay or torrent sites, and they're making a profit off of the artist music, um, why haven't the record labels just started, you know, instead of a, a a piracy network, just start giving it away instead? So the question really is about piracy and and what the attitude is and how the record industry or Warner Rec Brother Record is uh, dealing with this. I get asked that question a lot, um, just as an artist, how I feel about it, and, and I think that it's kind of a, you know, it's a little bit of a catch-22 in, in that um, it had it not been for piracy, uh, it prob I probably wouldn't have gotten where I am, and and, um, and then at the same time, it's kind of a drag, because I've, I've always bought my own music, and I bought my own music because I, I love to own an album. I look at it a lot more artistically than... Uh, Anytime I get something for free, personally, um, 
I usually don't end up listening to it. It feels a little cheap to me. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that um, people should take, take pride in, in ownership of, of art. Uh, however, I, I can't. I think it's done as much. It's probably done a little more good than bad for for someone like me. Whereas, if you're the the record label, <laughs> passing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's a tough thing for us as. I don't get paid no matter what. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> trying to decide where to buy his next house. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would, you know, look, it's a tough thing for us, the piracy. You know, there's a lot of places you can get free music. I guess, you know, some of it depends on what you call piracy. So, you know, BitTorrent sites from, from overseas that are just screen, giving away tons of free music. Uh, you know, that's a really challenging one for me. I, I don't see the benefit of that uh, to anybody. Um, but if you're talking about free music, you know, or people being able to 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 get music for free i think there are times when that's beneficial and certainly we as a company um are engaged in a lot of free situations whether it's uh um you know promotional type stuff whether it's giving music away through various sites whether it's freemium type models with spotify and pandora or other places where we allow people to, to use it for free for a period of time and then they have to pay us after at, at a certain point so, you know, we, we, we've taken a lot of different approaches and a lot of different looks. I think, you know, there's, there's, there's a continuum of piracy, too. And I think there gets to be a point where, where my feeling is we should shut it down. But I, I think that there is also a lot of use to free music on the internet. Great. Over here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd love to hear what are the, so being in the music industry, I'm sure that you're also looking at how internet is changing other businesses as well. I'd love to hear what firms outside of the music industry you're looking at and things that they're doing that are interesting that you're looking to apply to the music industry. So the question is, um, are you looking to other industries for inspiration um, if to, for the music industry? Yeah, I'm, yes, we're looking all the time. And we're, we're looking at them from different points of view. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to be the expert on, on everything in the music industry. But I would say that, uh, so I don't speak for everybody. But you know, look, we look at all, a lot of different companies from, uh, and, and how, you know, how they're using technology. Everybody, of course, from Google and Apple and, and, and the huge companies to to smaller companies, um, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever the whatever the the latest ones are, um, and really, what we're the the you know fundamentally, we're still you know our approach is how can we how can we either change our organization and change our company as a whole in order to better compete going forward, or how can we use these various technologies or, or, or partner with these companies to connect more fans to the music that our artists are making? So we, we generally approach it through, through those two things. And when we do that, the, the possibilities become fairly infinite. Um, and we're constantly looking to try to, uh, to try to do that. I think you might have seen just today or yesterday, we announced a Warner Music Group partnership with Shazam to you know, source talent, to find new artists, to use their data um, in helping us move forward. So you know, they're obviously a big technology company. But big or small, we're looking for companies we can have strategic partnerships with and or be in business with. Great. Yes? I've read that you studied law before going into the music industry. I was wondering what prompted that change. So the question is, Cameron, you were a lawyer. You studied law yeah. before this, and then you entered the music industry. So, what prompted you to make that change? Uh, well, a lot of different things. But um, you know, I studied law. I went to business school, and then I went to law school. I became essentially a criminal defense lawyer um, and a litigator. And uh, really, I wasn't prepared for it. I wasn't really emotionally able to do it. I, I, wasn't prepared for the negativity. I wasn't prepared for the misery and the negativity around it, frankly. Uh, I, I, I liked the intellectual challenge of it. Um, and when it really, when push came to shove, I'm sure it's something, I don't know if it's something that 
maybe it doesn't happen at Stanford, but for me when I was that age, it certainly happened, is that, you know, uh, it's hard to find something that you're really passionate about and that to me I would look to the re at the rest of my life. I remember when I was a lawyer at times I think, my God, the rest of my life doing this? You know, and I, and, and I didn't see a lot of really happy people um, and I just didn't have the passion and the belief that what I was doing was really that meaningful at, at, at a period of time. Uh, so um, I'd always been a music fan and music had been probably uh, Music and sports had been the most important things to me in my life uh, to that point. So um, really I started the record company um, because I just felt like, you know, if I could be a part of bringing music to the world that, that affected people the way it affected me, that would be a good thing and that would be a worthy thing to do with my time, my energy. And um, so that's what I did. Great. Last question. Yep. I'm really curious when you and your team are deciding to sign a new artist, what portion of your personal taste goes into that decision and what part of that decision is made by, you know, reaching a certain fan base, reaching a certain type of audience, filling a hole in your roster, so to speak? So the question is, how do you, when you're evaluating a new artist or a new song, how do your personal tastes come into play versus looking at more <laughs> strategically and how it fits a, fits a hole? Um, that's a good question. Uh, All these questions, I, I, very challenging. These are about a hundred times yeah. better than than your like the questions that I get on a daily basis. <laughs> you should take this one from like, from like a random like radio station like wants to know like how fast can you run a mile? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that today. I'm, yeah. Everybody's too intellectual. Oh, yeah. So I, I'd answer the question this way. I, I, it's a it's a really good question. Um, when I had my own business, uh, I would say, you know, if this was my personal taste and, and this is, is the records that we thought would sell, you know, we were trying to do this. <laughs> so uh, now, that I, now that it's a much bigger company and um, fortunately I'm the chairman and the CEO, uh, we have a team of people. And, and hopefully that they are finding things because you have to have that, I think somebody has to have that passion for it and that desire for it. So we try to have a, a, a variety of people who can answer that question you know, um, better than me. But I hope most of them sometime they're gonna show up and, and have a real reason for wanting to sign a particular artist or have a passion for it and be willing to stick with it and sort of and stick with it through thick and thin or, um, or find a way to make it work you know, find a way to connect it to fans, find a way to connect it to an audience, because, um, you know, that, that's it. So I, as far as the company at Warner's goes, my personal taste and what I particularly want to do um, is not necessarily a deciding factor. Although sometimes, um, you know, remarkably, I, I appreciate and like a lot of the music that's a wonderful note to note to end on. Um, I uh, hope you agree that this has been really fascinating and given us a, a view into a very different industry than we normally get to look at. If you're interested and curious to learn more about creativity and to polish your creative problem solving skills through the lens of music, I encourage you to take a look at this uh, new online class that we're working with them on. If you go to online.stanford.edu, you can get all the details. And please join me in welcoming or thanking our fabulous guests. <laughs>